So Karen, uh, let's start with the title. Uh, why subtle uh, and why tools? First of all, thank you for your kind words on the book and thanks for this discussion today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, why subtle and why tools? Um, you know, my, my basic sense of what went wrong after 9-11, and I'm always curious to hear your thoughts on this, is that so many of us on, have focused on strategic um, problems and tactical mistakes. Um, and with the idea that if we sunset the policies, we're, we're okay. Or if like during Obama, we don't use some of these tools that I'm gonna get to in a minute. But the, the fact is that the dangers are not just the policies. The dangers in this particular uh, story that I'm telling are the way in which those policies came about. And sort of the, 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 the culture of governance that was redirected and compromised after the war on terror. And my argument is that they, these, these subtle tools that I mentioned in the book, there are four of them, really change the way we do business in Washington and in domestic and international affairs, and that we can revise the policies all we want. But until, until we make it not acceptable, not okay um, to use these tools, um, we're in trouble. And so that's the subtle part is that it's what we don't see that comes before, you know, the policies themselves and on the way to the policies. And we don't see them because we've just sort of adjusted ourselves over 20 years to them? Because they're behavioral. They're not necessarily named, although I think when, you know, you name them, there's, they become, like, like, you could say, how subtle is that? But, <laughs> they are, they, you know, they, it, when you name them, you're like, yes, of course. But until you name them, you don't really see them. And so that's where the subtlety comes. Can, can you name them for us? I can try. Um, <laughs> one is the misuse of language. Um, and, and by that, I mean many things because it changed over presidencies and over time, but essentially, cloudy, fuzzy, imprecise language. And that was used, this is not the first time, but it was used in a very aggressive, intentional and heightened way after 9-11, particularly with the first pieces of legislation, but continuing throughout the war on terror in a number of places. And the idea was if, for example, in the authorization to use military force, you don't name an enemy, then the president has the power to go after whoever he wants, which is what we've seen happen over time. Um, and I can go through many instances of this, but um, and it's lasted till this day, it became a powerful tool in enabling the executive to do what it wanted to because the category was so broad. Um, whereas law is supposed to be the opposite, something the founding fathers talked about a lot. It's supposed to be precise. It's supposed to be contained. It's supposed to be enumerated. And we just sort of got away from that in a, what I think is a very damaging way. The second one, this will be no surprise to anyone, but I'm still putting it as a subtle tool, is secrecy. Right. The secrecy that we know we have to have for national security matters in the classified setting, et cetera, et cetera. The secrecy that was embraced by Bush and continually, even during Obama, even after his proclamations about you know, a commitment to transparency and that was ramped up and transformed under, um, under President Trump is really something that we need to address and that we need to um, have punitive uh, responses to when it's used to the extent that let's say Trump used it where he didn't even create the record. Right. It was all on a continuum, though, from writing secret memos to just not creating the record itself and many other things which we can talk about if we get into it. The third thing sort of follows from the first fuzzy language, and that is what I call a term which you might not like, which I call bureaucratic porousness. It's kind of a, a big term. And what I mean by that is institutional uh, fuzziness and imprecision. And the best example of that, but not the only example, was the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, which basically took things from treasury and agriculture and defense and justice and, and health and human services and more and just sort of lumped it together under the pretense that this was all about counterterrorism, which it quickly became about other things, largely the border, which it has you know, gradually morphed into today. 
Um, but that kind of disrespect for in institutional integrity, which also boils down to a disrespect that others have written about for professional integrity and professional professionalism um, is something that you've seen this administration actually try to respond to. Actually, I would argue that this administration's tried to respond to a number of these things or like set out its intentions, this administration being Biden. And the fourth is the willingness to bypass laws and norms, and that these other three tools, fuzzy language, secrecy, institutional porousness, basically allowed for and embraced this notion that if you needed to, laws and norms could be pushed aside. National security, war, and, and a couple of other concepts were there keeping the American people safe, and you could just do what you wanted. And, and, and these tools were used in tandem with one another in a number of instances throughout um, three presidencies. And and so these are the tools, and, and I think they need to be addressed, and they need to be addressed um, if for nothing else, then they sort of erase the notion of accountability, right? If you don't name what the law is about, well, who could be held accountable for the fact that you created a law, you know, created a law that did X, Y, Z? If you, if you don't um, pu punish secrecy, if there's no, you know, um, correction that's immediate, and if there's no, you know, um, accountability for the individual who writes memos that justify torture, even though it's against domestic military and international law, why would secrecy, you know, not be practiced? Um, if the DOJ and the DHS are allowed to just operate as one organization, and it goes on for 20 years, what does that mean in terms of the size of the powers of the government in that sector? Um, and in terms of bypassing laws and norms, I think that's more of an you know, obvious one, which is how far have we come from a respect for the rule of law and constitutional principles since 9-11? That makes sense. Yeah, well, there's not as much to unpack there. Um... I mean, some of these abuses were, uh, there were correctives made, right? I mean, the secret prisons closed, the coercive interrogations ended, the universal surveillance of all American communications when it became public as a result of the Snowden revelations. Um, you know, some of these things were fixed, right? The, well, that's my argument that the policies were sort of fixed, like even in surveillance, they weren't completely fixed. And But the fact that they weren't, um, rejected in a public way. The fact that they came into being this, you know, by under the guise of national security, that's still out there. The yeah. fact that you can create, they talk about repealing and replacing the 2001 AUMF, right? Well, I'd like to see that replacement because there are some very important things about this replacement that are these subtle tools. And one of them is that it ha we have to name an enemy. We have to name, at least give an indication that there is an end to hostilities that's in sight, what it would look like, even if you just mention it, which look, this is a contradistinction to all the authorizations for force that preceded it, as well as to declarations of war. So this, this we can't have a new one that just says something that's just as fuzzy. It doesn't matter if the, it, we sunset one, if we replace it with some Something that comes about in the in the same way, and the same thing about secrecy. If you can, if if it, if the policies were bad, what about the fact that we didn't know about the policies for how long? You know, the, the surveillance, for example, that in and of itself, to my mind, has to be addressed. Otherwise, you can get away with whatever you want to get away with as um, as a government. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the how would you sort of assess, I mean, it seems that one of the main impacts of 9-11 was to greatly increase the power of the executive and the presidency. Uh, I mean, as a, is this to an unprecedented level? I mean, has there been any other, I guess, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, right? And there have been, but how would, you, how would you score this in the broad sweep of American history? Yeah, I think this is unprecedented in that, first of all, there's more, more things to have power over, <laughs> you know, with, yeah. I wish I include also the global, the global network, both virtual and physical. Um, but I do think it's unprecedented. That doesn't mean that other presidents, Lincoln being one, FDR, you could argue in some ways being another, that just sort of were going to do what they were going to do the way they wanted to do it, often in the name of war, right? And war and security. And, but this is unprecedented in the sense that the emboldenment of the presidency by Congress, right? By 
um, the courts, the absolute willingness to virtually eradicate um, checks and balances and to violate the sense of the you know, separation of the branches of government, that to the degree to which this was done in so many ways is unprecedented. And there was no, other than you know, some pundits on the outside, there was no counterbalance. Congress fell down in its job and the courts definitely punted often saying in you know, judicial opinions, it's not our job to second guess national security policy that comes out of the executive. That seems like a cop out. Yeah, it seemed like a cop out then and it seems like a cop out now, which you know, is yes. That, but why, you know, but you know, I mean, the, 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 the Supreme Court seems very deferential to the president on matters of national security. Is that, I mean, has that been very static throughout the last 20 years or has it got worse, better? You know, it's interesting because we have so, you know, you look at Guantanamo, right? So and the detainee problem, the the people could say and people have said, look, the, the Supreme Court weighed in on this detainee issue by saying they had to have, you know, they had to be able to contest their rights, you know, with habeas proceedings, um, etc. And but that's very little in the scheme of things. And right now, I'm not sure the Supreme Court's going to make its next decisions in, you know, just in that vein. Um, so what I would say is this, the 20 years has something to do with it at well. If you have a limited war that isn't going to go on forever, then you think you can maybe redress it. There can be sort of a, a reset. But if it goes on this long, which is for a generation, where does the reset exactly go to? And I think that's what's happened in the courts, which is that there's, a, there's been a kind of knee-jerk deference um, to the executive. Um, look, there were times during the Trump administration that that um, courts tried to stand up, particularly on immigration matters, um, in, in a variety of, of, of circuits across the country, particularly in the West, in the Ninth Circuit, but also elsewhere. And what did the Solicitor General's office do? It, um, it, it stepped in. And what did the Supreme Court do? It allowed that. It, it what they did was they interrupted the proceedings that usually go from one court to a higher court, right, and appellate, and they just interrupted the court process. So this, this to is me, during, the, during the travel ban issue. Yeah, during the travel ban issue, and also in some of the um, immigration context cases, but mostly in the travel ban. And it just gives you a sense of how once it's okay to violate process a little bit, why not just do it, and um, without any um, idea that. Uh, okay, there needs to be some accounting for this, right? And it's 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 not about punishment. It's about this was wrong. Therefore, we're going to redefine this position in this way. You know, you only get to interfere in the process X number of times and X, something like that. I, I'm not, you know, I'm sort of riffing here, but something that's precise, that's contained, that understands that power given is power taken. You mentioned Guantanamo. You, of course, have written a very good book about the first year of Guantanamo. So, um, um, you that book came out what two thousand five or two, I can't re quite remember nine. I think two thousand nine. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I mean, it was it was eleven years ago, so or twelve years ago. Did you have any idea that it would still be um, open uh, when you wrote this book? Did you have any idea that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was still the operational commander of nine eleven would still not be on trial or not be in not be tried, not yeah. be tried. I, I, it's unfathomable to me um, as a citizen that we haven't tried the uh, the nine eleven co conspirators. You know, alleged nine eleven co conspirators. It's un. It, it's such a travesty to this, the idea of justice. It's such a violation of the idea of justice. Seriously, and we talk about why we can't get out of this era. Why? Well, this is one reason. Trials are meant to explain, to narrate, to put an endpoint to, to settle things, talk about subtle, to settle things we don't see so much and how it terms of it affects us and what it is. So I never thought that was possible. In terms of Guantanamo itself and the detainees, I don't remember, but I, I do remember that I was thinking, wow, it's going to be really great when I can write Guantanamo's last 100 days. And that was like 12 years ago. And I still don't see it. Yeah, but I mean, what is so let's just drill down a bit on that. I mean, you you follow the issue very closely and it seems that there have been multiple changes of prosecutors and defendants and COVID's intervened. And I mean, is there any prospect of a real trial? Anytime, and then I, I read, I think, on your very, very useful daily brief 
something about KSM maybe going to trial next year. Uh, yeah. Is that, even, is that feasible? Yeah, that's uh, probably not. Um, remember that every time the judge and the prosecutor changes, the people in charge, those positions, have to educate themselves about the case. That's the legitimate way to do it. So they have to read through thousands and thousands and thousands and years of documents, right? These guys have been at Guantanamo for 15 years. So all of the documents that be created around the case. Um, so it's not like they can snap their fingers and have it. However, and you and I both know, had they tried this in federal, or you can disagree, but I don't think you will. But had they tried this in federal court, like Eric Holder wanted to do, like we tried terrorism cases prior to 9-11 and after 9-11, there is no case that would have lasted this long. It, it could happen. It's a deeper bench. And I mean bench in terms of just support staff, teams, prosecutors who understand and know Al-Qaeda and terrorism. Um, um, I, I, you know, that that's one solution that probably won't happen. Another solution would be to take the death penalty off the table and allow some some pleas, some plea deals to go forward if defense attorneys would go for that. Um, so there are options. Um, but you and I both know that the problem well, the Biden administration. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously, Eric Colt didn't work for the Obama administration. And there was a completely faux controversy that somehow you couldn't try terrorists in the Southern District of New York. Uh, and in fact, there have been multiple, multiple trials of terrorists in the Southern District of New York since that without any, uh, you know, problem. So it was a completely faux controversy. Um, you know, if the Biden administration really wanted to close Guantanamo, wouldn't they try it again? Or are the political costs just so much that it's not even worth trying? I think they've made gestures to make it look like they want to close Guantanamo. You know, they cleared for release five additional detainees, right? You know, uh, I think it was at the beginning of the summer or sometime around then. Um, but that doubled the number who had been cleared for custody. The question is, will these review boards continue to meet and in a fast way think about, look, a lot of this work was done before when they were thinking about this at the very end of the Obama administration. So they know which countries they can work with and which countries they probably can't work with to resettle these individuals. Um, they know what the conditions of security are that they want from certain countries and what they need to what they need to insist upon to uh, to be able to present to Congress they, they, and to do it in a responsible way. They know the parameters in a way they didn't really know uh, until they started to do it at the end of the uh, Obama administration. So and they've started, you know, all of the trials begin are beginning to take on a kind of momentum. So, yeah. yeah but isn't the trickier question just putting the trial at Fort Leavenworth or, or because I mean, I, I presume there are still some sort of relatively innocuous people that can be shipped off to Kosovo or whatever. Um, and but then you have KSM and others who clearly have admitted their own role in 9-11. Uh, is it feasible to have a... a, a a Guantanamo military tribunal on a U.S. military base on, in the continental United States, or is that just too politically costly? Well, that's interesting that you say that, because the reason they can't do it is that for the past 10 years, the, the um, uh, appropriations bill for um, the Pentagon has said basically that you can't transfer any detainee here for any purpose whatsoever, yeah. right, from Guantanamo. Yeah. But the, 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 it was came out of committee, this version that, you know, it usually passes in like December. It came out of committee this year without that clause. Now, who knows how far that will get? But, you know, it's one of those glimmers of light you just want to hold on to. So it's not impossible. I actually think it's more likely that it might go into the federal court system where, you know, the idea is to your point about the faux narrative after, you know, uh, when they tried to, when Holder tried to bring the cases here, you know, there was a Guantanamo detainee who was transferred to federal court, Ahmed Gailani, to the Southern District of New York, who had been at a black site and had been tortured. And the evidence in his trial, some of the most important evidence, according to the prosecutors, came from a witness that had been identified during the uh, torture of Mr. Gailani. And that case happened. All right, it didn't have a decision that everyone liked because even though he's serving a life sentence, he was acquitted on 284 of 285 charges, right? But the fact is the case happened, it was resolved, there was a jury, there were all the security measures, you should have seen what it took to get into the 
courtroom um, and, and the amount of procedures they had. Um, and we can handle these cases. And the idea that the federal judiciary can't handle these cases, that the, the civilian courts can't handle these cases, beyond the whole 9-11 question is so, I think, damaging to the sort of character and sort of um, legitimacy of the courts themselves. Of course, they have to handle it. They have to be able to handle these cases. And if torture is, is something that keeps coming up, they need to be able to adjudicate that. That's what it means to have an actual rule of law and not just one that you use when it's convenient. Yeah. So, I mean, presidents as different as uh, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, and George W. Bush kind of have a, had a pretty similar approach on a number of issues. Uh, being the judge, jury, and executioner in drone strikes. Biden did suspend the drone strikes, but I, I, it appears that he started again in Somalia. So it's, and of course he, uh, the two drone strikes in in uh, Afghanistan, which yeah. um, one of which was a, you know, clearly a disastrous mistake. Um, but there seems to be sort of a kind of unity of, uh, you know, uh, the differences of course, but you know, they, they all use drone strikes. They all use, uh, special operations, special forces, uh, they all want a light footprint, uh, at least, you know, uh, once you get past the Iraq war and the Obama surge, you know, there's, there's, there's no more big conventional army. So how do you sort of think about that since there seems to be sort of bipartisan consensus around many of the, the tools that you describe, um, maybe not the subtle tools, uh, but at least uh, kind of the ones that, were, that, that are more obvious. I think, and this does go to the subtle tools, the idea that the president can, the executive writ large, can just decide who, what, when, where, and why to attack let, with a drone strike, let's say, it cannot really be the case. That, why can't there be a process by which you have to bring it to, you know, Congress, to some, you know, visible committee, something where you say, this is who we want to attack, where we want to attack them. It's not just the National Security Council. It's, it's, it's broader than that. And it's more balanced, you know, checks and balances than that. And we don't have that now. And so, yeah, the, we've come to accept that just when the executive wants to bomb somebody, they do. It used to be that you have to sort of say, we're bombing this person. I'm not saying they don't say it to themselves but we're bombing this person at this time for this reason. For example, you know, Obama used the word imminent, right? For, the, for uh, killing, let's say, Anwar Alaki, an American citizen. So the idea was um, he posed an imminent threat someday. It wasn't an imminent, we could say, here's when, where, and why, right? Or why we probably knew, but here's when and why. Yeah, but, the, but the definition of imminence was... Right. Sort of expanded in a sense, but it was 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 it completely wrong in the sense that because Marty Lederman and David Barron right wrote the opinion, yes. Um, yes. both of whom you know and uh, serious lawyers and uh, I mean the, I, I'm I'm going to paraphrase I think their reasoning. You you tell me where it, it, it's off. Um, you know, Alaki was training people to attack targets in the United States. He was doing so on a pretty consistent basis. There was no evidence that he was stopping doing that. He obviously tasked uh, the underwear bomber to blow up an American plane over Detroit. And, uh, you know, apparently Obama had no, Obama didn't give this a second thought. The constitutional law professor uh, was like, you know, he didn't, he didn't agonize over this one. So what was, you know, what should have happened there, do you think, or what, was this the right decision? Now, I'm not a real fan of the memo that set this out, but one thing in it also is that he couldn't be captured. That was one of the ideas, that he couldn't be captured and, and, um, and therefore killing was the only alternative. I want to repeat, he was an American citizen. We do have something called due process which has to do with you know, the, the rights of American citizens. The only way you can renounce that right is not by somebody in the White House saying, you've, uh, you've, you've given up your right to be a citizen. It, you have to actually renounce it. And, and you have to say those words and mm -hmm. in one form or another. And so you know, do we not trust ourselves to be able to you know, 
capture and try somebody like this? Do we need a system of being able to try people that we've captured in one country or, you know, look at Guantanamo, that's a, a mistake. But, uh, um, but I think it shows the weakness, uh, again, of our distrust in the justice system, which is kind of what rogue justice is about, right? I write about that kind of extensively there, which is we've just abandon our trust in that system to work. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it was, and this is true about the Obama administration writ large, they didn't think about someone else picking up these powers. They, they don't seem to have thought about the fact that once it was okay for people who thought they were acting within the constitution, within the rule of law, whatever, that somebody like Donald Trump could came along and then the strike against Soleimani, right? Which he uses in the same way, right? Afterwards, we hear it was imminent. There was imminent attack. And then, you know, when journalists and others drove, you know, delved down and say, well, what was the imminence? What was going to be attacked? Was it these bases? Was it what exactly? These embassies? There was no there there. And so, right. Well, you know, that, that, that raises an interesting question because you mentioned the Soleimani strike. I was surprised the Trump administration didn't more clearly articulate that, that basically it was the same reasoning as the Al-Aki Al strike. And in a way, the Al-Aki strike was a much harder case to make because he was an American citizen, Soleimani wasn't. Exactly. Like we didn't hear the Trump administration use this argument publicly. You know, that's exactly right. Well, they did use the word imminent without, you know, comparing. Actually, one of the officials does. I think I write about it. One of them does. Um, but but there's a different reason for that, which is that, and this goes to the, the heart of the Trump administration, um, they really didn't vet, as far as we can tell, the strike in the way you would want a National Security Council, you know, procedurally um, working. And so as a result, they hadn't come up with a legal rationale that they were going to use. And so in the week after, there's a whole chapter on this in the book, but a, a week after you have Esper saying one thing, you have Barr saying another thing, you have Bannon, everybody has a different legal procedural framework that they're using. In fact, there's a story about, you know, Esper going on NPR and having to come back on because he, he said what he thought was the case, but then when he got back to the office, he was told, no, 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 that's not the reason we're using today. And so mm -hmm. you saw it, they were confused, they were conflicted, which is what it means to bypass laws and norms. If you don't follow the norms of how you make a decision of this magnitude, there are other consequences, and this was one of them. So. It, so it, it was just a complete confusion, and that I, that fell into the confusion. What what were their rationale? Okay, and uh, just to remind uh, viewers, listeners, uh, please use Slido if you uh, want to submit a question. Um, and I'll just take the first question that just came up. It's an interesting one. Do you believe the lack of trials of 9-11 conspirators is to hide Saudi misconduct from Jack Keelan? So it's interesting. There's, I was just going over some of the Saudi, for a different reason, some of the you know allegations the the press has made in in these FOIA requests and trying to figure out about what the Saudi role is. I I think I wouldn't say it was specifically that. I do think that we've grown into a pattern where when they as a country where when things are just so complicated, it's not worth getting into. We 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 see it as not worth getting into. And I think the role of the Saudis, how limited, how precise, where it was, who was giving money to whom in the United States and what that actually means in terms of the royal family, where it was all coming from, it so, um, has been so neglected for so long. And now to get back into it just seems like, why? What, what is there to be gained from it? I still think, I think that has a lot to do with what's going on in Guantanamo. We seem to have gotten ourselves into a situation where when it's just too complicated, it's just not worth it. I want to turn to some specific uh, quotes in the book that I found striking. Um, essentially, you say that without all the things we've just discussed, the path to Donald Trump might never have been laid. So what 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 do you what did you mean by that? Um, do you have a few hours for me to tell you? <laughs> so, um, Let's take, um, I mean, Donald Trump is sort of the, the, all of this burst onto the scene all at once. So for example, secrecy is one obvious one that I think people know about. Donald Trump took secrecy that was already established, right? We can keep secret things about national security. We can sort of use that as a big rubric for them. And he based, and look, we'd seen it through Obama um, and 
uh, in a number of ways, including with the torture report, um, but you know, not re releasing all 6,000 pages of the torture report. But as I said before, Donald Trump decided not to create the record. And so what does that mean? That means we don't let, as John Bolton and others have reported, we don't really know what was said at certain meetings with foreign dignitaries and others because Trump made it issued an order. You can't take notes at this meeting. So there are no notes of it, right? You know, as you were saying that, Karen, it suddenly occurred to me, you know, we don't know who was in the White House at any given time, right? I mean, the I think yeah. didn't they abolish the White House sort of registration uh, system? Yeah, that used the White House login, they stuck, they, yeah. exactly. Thank you for bringing that up. So you, so you didn't have to sign in. So no, they did not, didn't have to, there was no place to sign in, right? Same thing with the border. Look what happened at the border when they separated, you know, sort of to switch categories here, when they separated children and, you know, families, they didn't keep a record on purpose of who they had separated. So you wanna know why we can't find parents, why this has been such a hurdle to reunite families? Well, if you don't create a record, there are lots of things that can happen afterwards. And a lot of things about the detention camps haven't been recorded. That's a lot better than having to worry about FOIA things that'll come down the road and maybe these secrets, you know, how we're treating people at Guantanamo or decisions to make, uh, to, to strike certain individuals might come out. There's just no uh, record of it. And, and we see this in other ways. I mean, Trump really, um, you know, stymied the use of subpoenas by the White House and by the courts in terms of getting White House officials to testify in a way that's really amazing how it worked. So, you know, that too, to me, is, is a kind of secrecy. And what I would say with Trump was that he understood how if you combine secrecy with fuzzy language, we're going to put a lot of bad guys in Guantanamo, you know, we're going to take all, uh, all Muslim ban, you know, rather than, you know, eventually there were specific, you know, some specifics added to it. But the idea that this was just carte blanche for these countries, um, that what you end up being able to do is lie much more easily because there's, there's nothing, there's both a lack of precedent for the language, which is something Trump did on numerous occasions, and a lack of precedent uh, and a lack of documents to be used to counter the lying. So, so just to, that's, you know, one kind of example. I think another example in how these tools morphed into tremendous abuse by Trump has to do with the institutional um, fuzziness, the lack of integrity between institutions and what that meant, or, or in, within institutions. The fact that the Department of Homeland Security created as a, a counterterrorism organization became a weapon against the southern border, immigrants coming in in the southern border in such a massive and uncontrolled way, particularly during Donald Trump, was built into the you know, fabric, sewn into the fabric of its creation from the start. And Trump used DHS as his law enforcement agency and with D, with William Barr and Sessions helping him. And so you see the guards from the border being, who many of whom were deputized without any real training, which, you know, has been reported in many places, um, taken to Portland for the Black Lives Matter protests, again, What's the what's the consistency between border guards, professionalism, training, legitimacy, mission, and and um, and Portland? It was who Donald Trump could send there. That was what you know. What if you do the thought experiment where 9/11 didn't really work out the way that Al Qaeda planned, and that you know instead of three almost three thousand people being killed, you know a couple hundred people got killed? Or, I mean, how how would our how would history have unfolded? I know there's a kind of big what if question. Let's say there were a few dozen Americans were killed, but it wasn't a catastrophic uh, attack. Right, let's say the towers didn't collapse. I yeah. mean, that's another way of saying that question. Yeah. It's a really good question because it still would have been, you know, a significant thing that a terrorist attack had taken a place. Um, I do think the Saudi connection at the outset to, your, to the earlier question would have looked in, been looked into, like what was the relationship between state power and and a non-state actor. Um, I do think the federal courts would have been handled the case um, because that was how we tended to do it, even after the ninety-eight bombings of the two U.S. embassies in East Africa. Um, I also think it would have, you know, you speak more about this than me, but the idea that bin Laden had more 
you know, bin Laden wanted us out of the Middle East. Okay. But he also talked about how if he, and I could be wrong, but you tell me, um, how if he attacked, you know, the financial capital of the world and the government institutions at the center of the United States, sort of the country would unravel via its response. The, the democracy that we so embraced would unravel by our response. I don't think that that would have happened. I think it would have been, a, because it would have been a more measured attack, it would have been a, a wholly different response. That doesn't mean that there weren't people looking for more powers at any excuse, right? And so that could have still, you know, that would well, have been- another, an way then, another way then of looking at this question is like, were there, uh, did this, did this, the whole sort of subtle tools universe just suddenly emerge after 9-11 or were there roots in earlier presidencies? A hundred percent there were roots earlier. Um, and, you know, a good example of that is Attorney General Barr, right? And his experience, um, many of them had come out of Reagan, you know, people who were in the Trump administration had come out of Reagan, but many of the people who were in the national security apparatus early on were infused with people who had come up, let's say through the Federalist Society, right? Which had been pushing for more executive power for you know decades prior to 9-11. There were a number of uh, legal- can I, can I ask you a question about that? What, why, did they, why did they want that? And what's, what's, the what's, 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 the, what's the purpose? You know, it depends on how cynical you wanna be. Um, so some would say the levers of power um, lead to, it's such a good question, the levers of power lead to um, uh, helping corporate interests and helping one's own personal interests. So that's one cabin thing. Another thing is that some just don't trust Congress to do to to adhere to principles that many think are very important. And those principles have to do with not going down the road of diversity, right? There are many people, we're seeing this now, you know, that don't really want the diverse sharing, the sh sharing by so many diverse elements, you know? They are lingering um, uh, and powerful trends of racism, among other things. Um, and that the president can can outweigh Congress and therefore make it so that the country doesn't continue to go down this road of over inclusiveness, over flexibility. Um, so that's I think that's another reason. I think there are people who there are factions in the United States that have always been uncomfortable with limits on government power through the Fourth Amendment, right, um, which involves the surveillance through um, through the Second Amendment, which is First um, I mean First Amendment, which is you know freedom of speech and assembly. And that discomfort has always been there, that what will we have? We will have sort of, you know, a tyranny of a truly democratic country. And so, as I say, it depends on how cynical you want to phrase it. But and, and that was recognized early on, you know, particularly, you know, um, in the 60s and afterwards. Another, another part from all of them, we're talking about... about um, the, 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 the authorization of the use of military force. You say in some it would be a war with either temporal nor geographical boundaries and lacking definitional limits when it came to the enemy. And we talked a little bit about that earlier, but walk us through kind of what the, do you think that was intentional? Or was, that, was it just in the heat of the moment? How did this develop? I think for many, it was the heat of the moment. Yeah. I think for uh, the White House, it was intentional. I think, but I, do, I, don't, I don't think you can so easily separate them, which is why one of the things that I really wish had happened after 9-11 when we talk about all of this, this trend uh, towards you know, um, untethered powers, couldn't there have been a rethink at some point? You know, six months, one year, 18 months, couldn't there have been a, okay, we know we reacted in ways that, you know, in our best moment, we wouldn't have reacted. A truly understandable overreaction, all right? So just, but can't we, can't we rethink this? Can we rethink the authorization for the use of military force and give it some specificity? Can we rethink some of the parts of the Patriot Act? Can we rethink all of the powers that have been mixed up with inside Department of Homeland Security? And that moment never happened. And, you know, in a way it's never, it hasn't really happened. It still hasn't happened. Twenty years. So I had to write a book. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Bin Laden had been captured or killed at the Battle of Tora Bora in December of two thousand one, along with 
you know, much of what remained of Al-Qaeda, you know, that could have been an inflection point. Absolutely. And you've written about this and you've talked about, you know, you've made this point about the way in which, you know, the pivot from Tora Bora to Iraq, which was already underway by December of 2001, um, yeah. was, was, it wasn't just a missed moment. It was like a, a missed necessity, right? And it also, you know, precipitated the, um, the next phase, which was nation building, rather than, you know, going after Al Qaeda. So it, it led both to the war in Iraq and to the endless war in Afghanistan. So I think I think you've made that point really well. And I, I'm a student of yours, so I agree with it. Well, and vice versa. <laughs> um, what about this sort of uh, another theme of your book is sort of the I guess the militarization of national security policy making, which obviously became. Um, I mean. You, you know, the CIA became a paramilitary organization to a large degree after 9-11, and then the Trump administration hired a, a, you know, a, a pretty large group of retired and serving senior generals. And can you reflect a, uh, a bit about all that? Yeah, this is the one of more uncomfortable things that's happened with that, you know, you 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 hear local places like places with like 800 citizens or 1500 citizens, I mean, really small towns, having these immense amount of military, um, you know, uh, vehicles, for example, that were, you know, sort of nine post 911 vehicles that were then distributed around the country, right, just in case. Um, and so both from the very top levels that have to do with, you know, changing the dimension of our agencies throughout more militarily, um, we sort of accept a kind of militarization. But I would have said something different. I just just I want to add to that, which is that we say militarization. This kind of is a counter to something you said, but it's also the you come up with the term the intelligenceification of the country, which has military consequences, which is that the number of offices that were stood up across the executive with an intelligence mandate that could interface in some ways, some more or less with the intelligence community that thought of themselves and define themselves in their mission statements as intelligence departments, for example, TSA, um, but certainly not only TSA, the proliferation of that has really completely altered um, how government thinks about its functioning. And it, and it dovetails with the secrecy, right? Because if it's intelligence and national security, then you know that also is something we're not gonna know about. And so I would say it's this combination of militarization in the way you've described and intelligenceification. And I don't know that there's a way, I think it's harder to come back from the intelligence one to wind it back than the military um, one. In, in some ways. Yeah, you know, one of the things that when I was working on my book about Trump and his generals that, that struck me and I, 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 I wrote a note to myself when I was reading your book. Yeah, I was struck by, you know, in Britain, there is no written constitution. Uh, and of course we have a, a written constitution in the United States, but I think Trump kind of um, showed how much we do have an unwritten constitution in the United States that we weren't really aware of. And I, I wondered if like you sort of felt that as you were writing the book. Did uh, you talk know. about norms a lot? And, and yeah. yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. I think, I think that's a really smart way of talking about the erosion. You know, what is the power of norms? When you yeah. establish a norm rather than a law, you know, how easily can it be broken and or redone? So the unwritten constitution part would be the norms. When you decide to kill an, a top Iranian general that's a state actor and not just a non, you know, right, that's a state actor, um, there are certain procedures and norms you have to go through. There's no law that says it actually has to be like that. It's just, it's kind of unwritten, right? How government functions, sometimes it's written and sometimes it isn't. You, you notice that um, one of the interesting things that Attorney General Merrick Garland has done is to create this document saying, this is gonna be the new norm for relationships between the White House and the Department of Justice. We're gonna have independence in these ways. Here's where we're obviously gonna have some kind of interdependence and intercommunication. 
but it's a way of addressing the kind of unwritten constitution, uh, the unwritten constitution idea that you're talking about. Like, okay, I can't rewrite the constitution, but I'm going to write a paper on norms and policies. This is Merrick Garland, right? I'm going to issue this paper on norms and policies that will address that even in an unwritten constitution, the best practices should be on paper and not just invisible, right? So I think there's a sense of, of what you're talking about. Yeah, I think this is a question from uh, David Sturman of New America. Um, and essentially, it, it's a question about undercover officers um, kind of uh, weaponizing and juicing sentences and with particular reference to the Padilla, the Padilla plot because it involved supposedly service to air missiles and undercover officers. And of course, you wrote Rogue Justice, which uh, reflected a fair amount on these issues. And what you, I mean, is this still a big issue or, or the, is this sort of declining because the number of jihadist terrorist cases are declining or is this, where do you come down? Okay, so it's a thank you for that question, David. Um, and so, you know, it's very interesting. I noticed that when journalists call these days, they'll often confuse informant cases and entrapment. It, they, they, they see them almost as equivalent. Um, okay. and, and they're not. The idea is that you could have, in theory, robust, robust um, contained, um, responsible informant cases. That's how the FBI works across a variety of sectors and has for a long time. What happened in a number of the terrorism cases was that the line between a legitimate inform informant case and um, a entrapment case began to get sort of, uh, you know, blurred over. And there are a number of reasons for it. One, wanting to have more and more cases, I think, you know, and you could say it was to keep us safer. Another reason was the lack of undercovers and the use of informants, right? Undercovers who work for the Bureau, who are trained to work for the Bureau. Then you get these guys who, you know, are facing deportation, some are facing jail, facing, you know, serious penalties who are asked, you speak Arabic, you know these guys, you're Muslim, could you please be our informant? As soon as you go down that road, your quality control um, you know, erodes. Uh, the, the most you know, notorious of these cases in my mind was the case of James Cromedy, which had to do with the bombing of community centers in Riverdale. And you know, just to give you an example of, I can't even tell you what went on in this case. It's, it's, it, it's at one end of entrapment. On the yeah. other hand, we see other cases where informants actually played a role in illuminating things that we might not have seen before that seemed you know, more interesting and have more there there. For example, in the JFK uh, plot at JFK to blow up the airline lines, the, the case revolved around kind of this terrorist network way beyond the defendant themselves. Um, that was actually, I think, informative and interesting. And so there's a whole range on this. And I hate when they get all lumped together as if it's just one policy. But, you know, when a policy goes awry, like in Lodi, another example, you know, of a case, when, when, a, when a case goes awry, it's very hard to, to bring it back to looking like a legitimate strategy. I think you've made the point uh, that no one has ever successfully argued an entrapment in these cases. Because the 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 the, the inform, you know the prosecutors who are running these cases are very careful about making sure the informant gets the person on camera to say multiple times, "Yep, I really want to go through with this," and that's very persuasive for a jury, right? Yeah, so, the uh, prosecutor turns to the def, def, to the jury and says the following: So I asked him if he would you know go through with this you know after eighteen months of not him not wanting to go through with it, I asked him if he'd go through with it, and he said yes. Would you have said yes? That's that's how it plays out in court. And the jury says is not going to say, yes, I would have said yes. Right. So it's a very hard it's very. And, you know, the entrapment defense includes, you know, if you can if the government can show some predisposition, it's kind of a two pronged case. If the jury can claim some kind of predisposition um, and, you know, they used anti-Semitism as predisposition in the case I was talking about, the Riverdale case. Um, and so there are all these ways you can pull on different strings, which is, you know, what the prosecutor's job is. In, and and it, 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 it's because of the way, it's not just about terrorism cases, it's the way the entrapment uh, defense is um, set up or entrapment prosecution is set up. It's, it's bigger than terrorism cases, I think. 
it's it's just very hard to argue uh, that it, there was real, the, the, even if there was entrapment in the way that anybody listening to this would think of it, it's hard as a legal matter to argue it. Correct. And in fact, in the Cromedy case you, you mentioned, I think the judge himself said that Cromedy was, I think he used the phrase, Shakespearean in, in his buffoonery. Yeah. Basically. It was basically, a, woman, a woman judge. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was. So, yeah, it was she, so I didn't realize. Her, and so she, and she just, I mean, she, her hands were tied, right? Because of uh, guide, guide, sentencing guidelines. Yeah. She said that, you know, in fact, judges have the um, authority to be able to do what they want within sentencing guidelines. They don't. But this is another thing, you know, to say I didn't have the authority to do it. She had a little more authority. And one of her reasonings, what, you know, she gave all of them, Cromedy and his uh, three um, co-defendants, uh, 25 years. And her thing was just, you agreed to go along with him. So that's just as bad, you know, so there was no attempt to really, you know, articulate this. And that's because I think terrorism cases are very, very hard to, you know, if you're weak on, look what happened. We lost the 9-11 trial because um, Ahmed Gailani, you know, only got a life sentence. So. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's it's like, um, so yeah, I, I don't love that when judges say that, but she did say that. This is a question from the audience, um, it, I guess, relating to your overall, I mean, the book overall. Don't you think this relates to the belief in American exceptionalism, fear of being blamed for the next attack and the emotional reaction to a tragedy? Yes, which is why I think there needed to be a reset or a rethink at some point in time. And I, and I do think we need to legislatively or normatively, if you prefer, really think about that, which we haven't. All we ever talk about is, you know, some kind of, you know, analysis of this part, you know, commission a report on this part or that part. But I, I think there's something about we need a commission into the response to 9-11 and how we learn things. And one of the things we learned was you need to reconsider, not just, you know, little piece of legislation by little clause of legislation, but reconsider in the aggregate what this was. So the answer is yes. Um, I notice in the defense authorization bill, there is money for an independent commission to look at what happened in Afghanistan. This, and this would not be, um, you know, um, uh, it would really be independent. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, um, that, that wouldn't be answer all your questions, but it might, might answer some of them, right? Well, I think it could answer a lot of them. I think focusing just on Afghanistan um, uh, depends on how they define, you know, what they mean by, but let's just say it's on the 20 years of the U.S. presence in Afghanistan, could tell us a lot. Among the things it could tell us is, and this gets, you know, into the um, procedures and secrecy and bypassing norms, you know, what was and what wasn't reported uh, correctly back to Washington, right? That's one of the things we've seen about Afghanistan is that how much you can get away with. Uh, I also think the question of, that I tried to dodge before, but the question of who made money on this is going to, that's going to be a large part of that Afghanistan report. And I think that's going to be a very brave uh, enterprise to take on. Um, we have uh, one another question and, and about four more minutes. So I'm going to get to this question. Um, is a recourse um, outside organization or political strategy, et cetera, to hold accountable the very systems of checks and balances that failed? In other words, what now? I mean, and you, you've kind of suggested one what now. now? I actually think that's a really good idea, which is there a um, assessment? of checks and balances that we can come up with and therefore look at it. And right now we don't have that. But Peter, think about all the different things that New America, you know, does in terms of looking at, um, you know, policies and weighing them and sort of, you know, giving numbers to them. I mean, it's doable, it's vast, but I do think there should be, a, oh, when we get to the end of this, how do we know that checks and balances have been, you know, followed? There, there's no... Uh, way to um, really do that to date. And we could set up new norms. Um, we just haven't. Well, um, like something else I learned from your uh, very useful daily brief, which I read religiously every morning, is it seems to be a movement. Um, it's This is kind of a, a smaller part of the bigger thing, but like uh, a movement to really enshrine in law for the prevention of what happened with the waiver 
on Mattis and the waiver on Lloyd Austin for you know, senior military officers to become Secretary of Defense. That seems to be a, a smaller part of the bigger question, which is, you know, the re, kind of doing something about the authorization for the use of military force. So maybe as you get, as, oh. as we end this, can you talk about A, the small question and B, the big question and what you think is likely to happen and what will it look like? Yeah, well, the small question on, you know, the waivers for Mattis and Austin were, that's again, you don't just push aside laws and norms that you have. The idea of having civilian control of the military was real and it was put in place for a reason, which was to have some kind of check and balance within the agency itself so that the, the, the militarization that you're talking about had some kind of reflection on what does it mean for the society? What does this mean for our political identity? What does this mean for the character of the country? Instead, we push that aside, um, first Trump um, and, then, uh, and then Biden. And for all of his wonderful characteristics, pushing it aside, in my mind, was not pushing it aside, was more important for sort of resetting the tone of just pushing aside the, these laws and norms that happened uh, uh, over this period of time. In terms of the larger issues, I think we need a serious rethink. I think it's the 21st century. I think that so many of the push and pulls on government and um, on the executive are so different than the founding fathers had them. I think, you know, you see these panels to think about rethinking the Supreme Court. No, I think we should have a calm, thoughtful, this is what think tanks are for, you know, we could divide up among ourselves. You do most of the work. I'll just take a little, no. And, um, we, we, and, and just sort of be, not be so scared because of the partisan moment we live in of rethinking certain things and saying, maybe we need a little more here. Maybe we need a little less here. Um, unfortunately, we live in an age where it just seems that the urge to power for personal political gain um, just stymies any real open-minded thought. So that's my kind of, I wish, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. Well, hopefully we will not be uh gathering on the 30th anniversary of 9-11 to discuss that nothing really changed and Guantanamo is still- uh, My God, stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, Karen, thank you for a brilliant presentation. Uh, thank you for everybody who listened to this and uh, go out and buy Karen's book. It's brilliant and it should be any anybody interested in uh, journalism, politics and law over the last two decades will find the book very illuminating. Thank you so much, Peter. It was a pleasure. As always.